This is the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruski. Featuring former FBI special agent and chief of the counterintelligence behavioral analysis program, Robin Dreek. Alec Murda, attorneys uh, for Alec have filed documents now asking a federal government to take control of his assets. This can be looked at in one of two ways. They are moving in what they're saying on the surface is to put the assets from receivership where they're currently held and place them in the custody of the U.S. government, basically saying, you guys be the referee, you guys hand out the money. Their reasoning is because the special referee that the that had been assigned or they want to initially handle this would cost several hundred thousand dollars of the existing money. And they're arguing that, well, if the government gets this, it would be free to be split up and less of this would go to another uh, party that would be monitoring and disturbing the money. Sounds lovely on the surface, but it seems like too generous of, of a move, quite honestly, of anything coming out of the Alec Murdoch camp. Could this be true? Is there any legitimacy to this idea of moving it there versus here? Or is this more of a, let's move it to the government because, well, let's hope for the best. Maybe the victims will get their money and I don't know, before they're dead. <laughs> Yeah, you know, two things every time I hear the word, <laughs> the name Alec Murda. One, I'm, you know, I think the world is so sick of this guy. <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to keep seeing levels of corruption and infiltration of malfeasance anytime we look at this and every time I look at him. You know, my initial reaction is okay, we're moving it to someone who might be a, a better impartial judge. Mm hmm. Maybe. Except, and I always say maybe because in recent years we've seen a lack of trust in government organizations and institutions. So I'm optimistic, <laughs> that, you know, that justice will be served to the victims, but we'll see. It, it feels like, I mean, yes, of course, this other one has some red tape with it, but it, you know what it is. It's several hundred thousand dollars in their fees. They say right here, this is what it's going to cost. We're going to manage this and distribute it this way and that way. This is what we're going to be. Throwing it over to the government, kind of, it's like, well, hope you got a system in order to do this <laughs> and hope that actually follows through. And it just seems like a very big risk of a lot of red tape of people who probably desperately need some of their money that has been stolen from them for many years. I mean, in theory, if they could go out and this is a great idea, wonderful. I don't know. It, I've heard arguments on both areas where it's almost, and I don't know how accurate it is, but almost kind of a, a screw you to the victims of like, oh, you want your money here? Good luck. Go get it from the government now. We gave it to them. You know, you hit a key word right there or a key statement, and that is a system that may or may not be ready to receive this kind of tasking. And yeah, you know, when you give something to the government and you start dealing with government employees who aren't motivated by output, Mm -hmm. because they don't have they don't produce a product or a service that their jobs are dependent upon. Yeah. <laughs> you could wind up with the greatest person in the world that is a real evangelist for mm -hmm. righting the wrongs and they're a public servant because they love to serve and but at the same time you can deal with someone who is invited to sit on their ass for 20 years and do nothing and wait to get to their pension. I mean yeah. you it's a real crap show. And again, that, that's that's Robin just giving you a, a look behind the code of the matrix there. Yeah. But I've seen it. And because I was part of it, I sure. was part of the government for 32 years, you know, between the Marine Corps and the FBI. And I have seen the most amazing individuals that could run corporations. And I saw other individuals I, I wouldn't buy a bag of peanuts from. Sure. You know, so it really depends on who they get and if there's good oversight. And if there's a good person to kind of poke them and they're not overwhelmed with a million other things, which they probably are, it could go very well. But at the same time, it could go very poorly. I'm hopeful. I'm hoping that there is good oversight and good accountability for whoever they assign it to. Because, again, keeping the victims in mind is the only thing that truly matters, I think, in this one. That is. I mean, that really truly is the main thing to keep in mind on all of this. That's why, uh, I mean... I get, yeah, there's those fees that go along, and so are attorneys. The attorneys, I don't really quite understand the angle that Murdoch's attorneys are coming from on this of, oh, we really want to make sure the victims get the most of their money, when they're like, and by the way, our fee is all of this, and we ate it all up, and they did say that they're going to perform their services for him pro bono going forward, but where there is money to be had, they still want to take their piece, so why they're very concerned about several hundred thousand dollars going to another professional firm. I don't know really why that they're so concerned about that because that's how this normally would go. 
Uh, and the other thing to your point uh, of, of yes, getting into the system, the government system, you may have that wonderful person there that really is going to be an advocate, but then there's 20 other people that have to rubber stamp something to get thing out. And, and maybe some are good at doing that and maybe some really are not. They're just creating more and more red tape. It just seems like an unnecessary extra hoop to have the victims have to jump through to try and get their money. Yeah, it's interesting, but you, you hit on something that I think is important, kind of same in, in Murdoch's uh, case and potential retrial, because I really think that's the motivation here of, with his attorneys. Yeah, It's to try to paint him in the best light possible to taking care of victims, to pleading guilty to all the financial issues, saying, listen, he's a truthful person. He would say the truth. If he did anything wrong, he's got a track record now of saying so and of owning his mistakes. So that way, if they get the retrial, mm. there's going to be those seeds of doubt with a jury. And I really think that's what is, again, I'm projecting and I'm using oh. a lot of conjecture because it's fun. But I'm thinking that his defense attorneys are doing just that. They're, I think they're angling for the best optics they can for a retrial. Paint Alec in a very good light for the next year yep. or two. Make him show like he's doing really good deeds and he's owning up to his, his problems and his faults. And then when it goes to retrial, maybe they won't be so hard on him because he, he wouldn't really have a track record of good deeds as right. he did not have going into the last trial. They were talking at CrimeCon the other day. When I say they, I'm talking about Dick Harputa, Harputalin. I can never say his name right to save my life. <laughs> he was on stage. I guess he sang a little bit, uh, opened it up with a, a song and dance number. I'm not even exaggerating. And uh, then uh, gave a, a speech and talked about uh, other possible suspects in the case, claiming that there's a great deal of information that's emerged since the trial that would be beneficial in the second trial. I'm sure there is, but I'm very curious if there ever has been any angle to other suspects, because we certainly haven't ever heard any inkling of anything of that nature. If there were to be other suspects why did they not try to go down that road in the original trial of saying there's someone else that did this what they had were essentially little people with guns was the only thing that they came up mm -hmm. with yeah i still go you know, back to first impressions of law enforcement when they show up on scene especially if law enforcement has reps and years and, and a life arc of dealing with these kind of situations their initial impressions were exactly what the outcome was mm -hmm. and again granted that'll give you a confirmation bias when conducting the investigation unless you have good investigators and i think they had great investigators but to your point if there was more that they could have brought forward to defend him, they would have. If there was other, but what's happening now, again, in my conjecture life of pessimism in, in regarding <laughs> Alec Murdoch and that whole region, is they're having more and more time fleshing out people willing to take a fall. <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I literally think that's all they're doing. They're biding more time to get someone anywhere that they can either. Place to blame on, place reasonable doubt of the situation, who was here. I mean, that's all they're doing right now. They're literally just playing the reasonable doubt game with everyone they possibly can. At the same time, they're trying to boost his public image. All about the image, because that's what's going to make a difference in the new trial, if, in fact, yep. he is granted one. Yep. No, I give his attorneys credit for working every single angle they possibly can. That's what they get paid to do. Yeah. You're consuming the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.